All right, good morning, Three Circle. Great to be with you guys. We are going to continue the Passover series today here and at all of our campuses, Thomasville, uh, Midtown, Mobile, Daphne, and online. So the Passover series has kind of been our on-ramp to the Easter season. And what we've done is we have taken a look at the Old Testament Exodus and the Passover that was instituted there. And we're taking a look at the Lord's Supper that Jesus instituted in the New Testament. And what we tried to show is the connections between the two, parallels between the two, and also show the superiority of what Jesus would do. So let me just remind you, the people of God, the nation of Israel, had become a really big nation in Egypt, and they had become slaves to the Egyptians. The Egyptians were the most powerful nation on the earth at that time, and God decides that he is going to rescue his people out of Egyptian slavery. He does so by sending a series of plagues on the nation of uh, Egypt. And Egypt will not let God's people go. So he finally does one final plague, and it is to take the firstborn of all the Egyptians. And it was a horrific night. The death angel of God came to Egypt, but God protected his people. And how he did this was a, was a thing called the Passover. He had them take an unblemished lamb, the most perfect lamb they could find, and sacrifice it, and put that blood on the doorpost of their homes. A lamb, a Passover lamb for each house. And they had to make bread, and the bread had to be unleavened, which made made it pure bread, no leaven, all right? And these things happened, and if they had done that, the death angel would pass over. That's why it's called the Passover. It would pass over the homes of the Israelites. That's exactly what happened that night. And then year after year, they were commanded to keep this practice, to commemorate what God had done for them. Now, they didn't understand it fully, but we understand now that what that was was a preview to a movie that was coming, a really good one, all right? And we have all seen previews to movies. Have you ever seen a preview and then you went and saw the movie and the movie was not as good as the preview made you think it would be? Well, that is not the case with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The previews of the Old Testament actually underplayed just how great Jesus was going to be and what he was going to do. But the Passover of the Old Testament was a preview to what Jesus would do on the cross and that what we commemorate with the Lord's Supper. And that's what this series has been all about. For us to forever have a deeper appreciation for what Jesus has done for us, for what it all meant For us to understand when we hold the cup in our hand, when we hold the bread in our hand, what are we talking about? For us as Christians to understand what we believe, what we celebrate during this time. So we're going to dive into that now. Let's go to Matthew 26, uh, uh, 26, 27 through 28. So we go there to that upper room with the disciples, with Jesus, and Jesus is instituting the Lord's Supper. Last week, we looked at the bread. When he broke the bread and he said, this is my body, eat of it. Today, we're going to look at the wine, the juice, to make the Baptist more comfortable. It's just a little joke. It's a little preacher joke. (laughs) It works every time. He takes the cup, Matthew 26, 27. He took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink of it, All of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. For many for the forgiveness of sins. Now, let's just dive into what just happened there. The thing I want you to understand that Jesus is doing here is he is clarifying the elements of the Passover. Nothing is new about what he has done so far. The bread's not new. The wine is not new. Every Jewish person had been doing this since they were kids. They kept the Passover every single year. Jesus had the Passover meal with his disciples every single year. This was not new. Then what was new? Jesus changed for them how they understood it. And he says, hey, this bread you've been eating your whole life, it stood for something. It stood for me, my body, broken for you. My body was represented in that veil that separated humans from the Holy of Holies. And my body is going to be broken literally, physically to open a way for you to the presence of God. And on the next thing he did is he grabbed that cup of wine and he said, now I need to tell you what this represents. This thing you've been doing all of these years, you need to know that it represents something as well. It represents my blood. Now, let me clarify something. We talked about this last week. When Jesus began to teach his followers and they subsequently, after the resurrection, began to take the Lord's Supper the way we do, not once a year, but on a regular basis, 
We do often, throughout the year, we take the Lord's Supper as a church. Why we do that is because Jesus told us to. Well, the early church was doing it as well, and the Roman Empire used that against the early Christians. You know what they did? They spread a rumor, and they said, you do know that those crazy Christians, they are cannibals. And people in all these Roman communities would go, what? They're cannibals? And they said, yeah, they're cannibals. They eat flesh and drink blood. Just go ask them. And sure enough, they would look into it. And yeah, on a regular basis, Christians were using that language. We're eating blood or eating flesh and drinking blood. Well, they are cannibals. These people are crazy. And, and, and they misunderstood something that we as Christians need to understand. When Jesus talked about eating flesh and drinking blood, he was talking spiritual, not physical. Now, let me remind you again how this works. You have a physical body, right? And you have a spiritual person. You are spiritual and physical beings. You have a body, you got a soul, you got a spirit, you got a mind. That's all invisible, but you have one. Trust me, it makes you who you really are. And you have a physical body. Your physical body, Jesus made this clear over and over again, your physical body needs hydration, water, liquid, and it needs nutrition. It needs food. Your body does. Okay, And how you consume those two things is you swallow hydration and you chew up and swallow the nutrition. That's how God designed your body. And that's how your body stays alive. Jesus tells us that we have a spiritual side of us that also has to be nourished. And he uses things that you and I can understand to help us relate it. And he says, you must, just like your body, must drink and eat your spirit must drink and eat. And what feeds your spiritual side? Jesus. He does. And that begs a question. If I chew physical food and I swallow physical hydration, then how do I eat of Jesus and drink of Jesus? By believing in him. That's what he says. He says, those who drink of me believe in me. Those who eat of me believe in me. So how, do you nur- how does your soul come alive? By eating and drinking of Jesus. And how do I do that? By believing upon him. So how many of you in this room have believed upon Jesus for your salvation? That means your spirit came alive. You were once dead. Now you are alive. And the way you came to life is by eating and drinking of Jesus by believing upon him. We all tracking together now, right? So the Romans had it wrong. They had a lot of stuff wrong. They crucified the Son of God. The early Christians were not cannibals. No, they believed in what Jesus was teaching them, the spiritual concept. Jesus was clarifying the elements of the Passover. Now, Jesus would then go and do what all those other sacrifices were all about. His body would be broken, his blood would be shed, and he would physically die to pave a way for us to God. And we're going to look at just what his blood did. We looked at the body in depth last week. We're going to look at the blood today. And to do so, we go to the New Testament and we see that the writers of the New Testament, in particular the writer of the book of Hebrews, goes into great depths to help us understand just what happened when Jesus died and when Jesus was crucified and when he sacrificed his life. What all happened there? Well, The book of Hebrews is going to help us understand that. So what we're about to do, I hope y'all are ready, is we're going to go hiking, okay? You ever been on a hike that just wore you out? It was, but but the view was incredible when you got up there. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? I'm not talking about those sweet little trails in Gatlinburg that someone paved for you, you know? I'm talking about the one you got to do a little work. But you get to the top, you're like, absolutely worth it. Okay, we're going to read what I would call theological hiking for a moment. We're going to go into the book of Hebrews, and we're going to dive deeply into this. And I want you to hang on, because you need what you're about to hear. It's going to unlock for you just what Jesus did and just who he was. Now, to do that, I need to show you something that happened on your handout. So Hebrews 9.1 is actually somehow became a fill-in-the-blank on your handout. So I want you to go below this big paragraph of writing at all the campuses and online. You can go here. And you will find a fill-in-the-blank there that's actually Hebrews 9.1. So we'll give that to you first. Because what the writer of Hebrews is going to do is begin to talk to us about the Old Testament system, the way they worship God, and how Jesus completed it for us. So the first verse is right there. You can fill in those blanks and put Hebrews 9.1. That's what it is. Now, even the first covenant, what's the first covenant? That's the Mosaic law. 
It's the Mosaic Covenant. There were a bunch of covenants in the Old Testament. The Noahic Covenant, the Abrahamic Covenant, the Davidic Covenant. But when New Testament writers talk about the covenant of the Old, they're talking about the Mosaic Covenant at Sinai. They're talking about the law of God written down. Okay, God's law on stone. That's the first covenant. And, and, and the writer of Hebrews says that first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness. We all understand that, right? It was complex, wasn't it? I mean, you didn't just roll up in with a cool song and start worshiping God in the Old Testament. Like, you had a system, and it was complex to get to the presence of God, and you never got into the Holy of Holies. Only one guy could do that once a year, and that was the high priest. We'll see more about that. So that's verse 1. We understand now we go to verse 6, and we'll continue reading. These preparations having thus been made. So in the Old Testament, they made all those preparations. The priest would go regularly, so they did this all the time, into the first section of the temple. They would do their ritual duties. But into the second, which is considered the Holy of Holies behind the veil, into the second, only the high priest goes, and he would only do it once a year. And not without taking blood, which he offers for himself. See, he was a sinner too. He wasn't perfect. And for the unintentional sins of the people. Now, how complex is that? He can only do it once a year. he got to be real careful when he does it. He better take some blood in there to cover himself and those that he is representing. Okay? All of this, the writer of Hebrews is trying to tell all of us how awesome Jesus is. Verse 8. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates, so the Holy Spirit was trying to show us, that the way into the holy place is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing. That means Jesus had not come yet, which is symbolic for the present age. According to this arrangement, what arrangement? The Mosaic Covenant. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered. And watch this. Two things are about to happen. Don't miss this. The first thing he's going to do is show you what all of those sacrifices could not do. Here's what they never did. You ready? All of those things cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper. No one who ever sacrificed a lamb cleansed their hearts. It never did that. It never accomplished that. Here's what it did do, though, verse 10. It dealt only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. Until what time? That night in that upper room with Jesus and that next morning on a cross. It's going to change everything. But until that time, the only thing that that did, that sacrifice every year, is it did an external symbol for the people. Verse 11. This, this should get you worshiping right here. All that happened, but when Christ appeared, everybody say, but when Christ. Isn't that all of our story? I was a mess, but when Christ appeared. I was going the wrong way, but when Christ appeared, my marriage was falling apart, but when Christ appeared, I was a drug addict, but when Christ appeared, I was addicted to pornography, but when Christ appeared, I was on my way to hell and eternity without God, but when Christ appeared, how many of you, that's your story? When Christ appeared, but when Christ appeared as a high priest, remember there, was a, there were other high priests, but they were sinners. They had to bring blood for themselves, but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, his own body, verse 12, he entered once and for all, not once a year, once and for all, into the holy place. He didn't do it by means of blood of goats and calves, but by the means of his own blood, thus securing, securing, that's a big word, an eternal, not once a year, an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with ashes of a heifer, if they sanctified the flesh outside, how much more will the blood of Christ, through the eternal spirit offered himself, without blemish to God, purify, uh-oh, now we're talking inside, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Therefore, Jesus is now the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called, that's Christians, may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Here's why. Here's the linchpin for it all. Since a death has occurred. What death? Jesus on the cross. That death redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Wow. Now, we, how many of y'all are tired from that hike? But how many of you know the view was worth it? Was the view worth it to see what Jesus has done for you? So here's what I want you to understand. Let me help you understand this, what Jesus accomplished through his blood. So at my house, we clean the counters in our kitchen with a very important thing. And during the pandemic, it was very hard to find this stuff. 
my wife would send me on an expedition. I was a Lysol ninja, okay, because I was looking for this stuff right here. Here's what we clean our counters with. And it's good stuff. And let me tell you how good it is. So it cleans, it says, 99% of all viruses and bacteria. It kills them. 99.9% of that is pretty good. That's not bad. But here's something that we have to grapple with every day at our house. Even after we clean all the counters, and we wipe it all down, there's still bacteria and viruses just crawling around on our counters. Oh, it got most of it. But what they cannot claim is that they got all of it. They cannot claim that. No matter how much you, it's still there. Oh, you don't see it, but I hope you'll always know it's there now. I'm here to be a blessing. Every day we spray it. Now, here's what I want you to understand. I want to leave this up for a second. As you look at that, that's pretty good, though. The Old Testament sacrifices could not even claim that. When it comes to the virus of sin, all of the Old Testament sacrifices, I, I want to ask you, how much of sin did the Old Testament sacrifices eradicate and kill? How much? Zero. Zero. It never accomplished any of that. Let me tell you what it did. Once a year, what it did is it kicked the can of sin a year down the road. It didn't deal with it. It didn't eradicate it. It didn't make it go away. A high priest with trembling hands and trembling knees would walk into the Holy of Holies and sprinkle some blood and kick the can of sin down the road another year. And then the next year, another one had to do it. Year after year after year after year. That's what happened. So if the Old Testament sacrificial system was a spray for your counters in your kitchen, here's what it would do. You would spray it, and it wouldn't kill anything. It would just make the bacteria run to the side of your counter and just sit there all year. You just know it's still there. And over the year, it would come back out into the middle, and you'd spray it again, and every year just move it aside, but it never kill anything. This is why the, the writer of Hebrews wants you to understand the superiority of what Jesus did once and for all as compared to all the other Passovers and all the other Passover lambs. And this is why this Friday night at our Tenebrae gatherings or wherever you take the Lord's Supper this weekend for Easter, that's why when we grab that little cup and that little wafer, we, we hold that in such high regard because of what it symbolizes, what it means to us. What Jesus has done for us, write it down. The blood of Jesus satisfied the wrath of God, and that is something no other sacrifice ever could do. He satisfied the wrath of God. He didn't just kick the can down the road. In fact, let me make this clear. Every time a priest kicked the can of sin down the road, they were kicking it in one direction, and it was Golgotha. It was Calvary. It was where Jesus would die, and that would be the final one. Jesus didn't just kick sin down the road. He eradicated the wrath of God and satisfied it for all of us who believe. How many of you are grateful for that today? So look what Colossians 1, 19 through 20 says about Jesus. It says, for in Jesus, two things here. First, his divinity, his godship. In him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. So Jesus was fully God, fully human. Watch this. Through him to reconcile to himself, to God, all things, whether on earth or in heaven, watch this, making peace by the blood of his cross. How did Jesus make peace between humans and God, between rebellious sinners and God? He did it through the blood of his cross. That's why the blood is so precious. That's why we celebrate the blood of Christ. It matters to us. The Bible says here he made peace by the blood of his cross. He did not. See, I grew up with one half of the gospel in many ways. I grew up hearing that Jesus saved me from sin, saved me from these things. That is true. But he also saved me for something. See, if God only paid off our debts in Jesus, then we would just be neutral with him. He'd say, well, you don't owe me anymore. We don't have to see each other. You're good. You don't owe me. We're done. That's not what he did. He not only paid off our debt, what else did he do? He adopted us into his family. So God says, it's not that I just don't want you to not owe me anymore. I want you to know me now. We're going to know each other. We're going to be in a relationship. You get to enjoy me forever. You get to be in my family. There is a seat at my table with your name on it forever. That's what God has done for us. He made peace with us. 
It's really, really, really good news. That's why, listen, if you've heard the gospel before and it didn't sound like good news, they didn't say it right. You didn't hear it right. It's good news. So let's talk about the blood of Jesus, because I grew up with the blood of Jesus. We sang about it all the time, right? Do y'all remember that song? I think it was Andre Crouch did that song, The Blood That Gives Me Strength From Day to Day. It will never lose. Come on, somebody. And it reaches, come on, to the high. Look at all the Baptists. There they are. I made you mad with a wine comment. You're back in now with the Andre Crouch song. I got you. Let's talk about the blood of Jesus. And not just sing about it, but understand what it has accomplished and done for us. The blood of his cross. Number one, the blood of Jesus saves the sinner. Jesus has saved us by his blood. Ephesians 1 7 says this In Jesus, in him, we have redemption through his blood. Make no mistake, it's through his blood, not through following his commands. That's not how we have redemption, because we cannot follow his commands perfectly. Let's be honest, none of you can save yourselves. You didn't even make it through Sunday morning today, y'all, without needing God to save you. Am I right? Can any of you go, my record's been perfect so far today? No, it has not. If you raise your hand, you're lying. None of us even make it through mid-morning. We need Jesus. We have redemption through his blood. If there is redeemed people, you were redeemed through his blood. There is no redemption apart from the blood of Jesus. There is no redemption in any other religion. There is no redemption in you doing good works. You can become a social justice warrior and do a lot of great things in this world. It won't get you to the Father. You can vote Republican. It won't get you to the Father. You can become a Democrat. It won't get you to the Father. No matter how you vote, you can like the right football team. You can listen to George Strait and Tim McGraw and be a good Southerner, and it won't get you to heaven. Being a good person doesn't get you to heaven. It doesn't. Only the blood of Jesus... One thing I can guarantee, you get to heaven, you look around, there's other people there, they all got there through the blood of Jesus. There's one thing you can guarantee, there will be people from all over, it's going to surprise you who's going to be in heaven. You're going to be like, no way. (laughs) Be careful though, because there are going to be some people, when they see you, (laughs) they're going to go, no way, man. But you can guarantee that everyone you see will be there because of the blood of Jesus. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. We get his motivation. Why would he do all of this? Because he is rich in grace. Because he is a loving God. Because he wills that no one would perish, but that everyone would believe and have everlasting life. That that's what he wants for you. Do you even know how much God loves you? As we go into this Easter season... Do you know how much God loves you? Has he not shown you how much he loves you and how good he is? He is rich in grace, slow to anger, unbelievably kind and patient. That's the love of our God. And he has reconciled us to himself. The forgiveness of our trespass. You do know that everyone in this room, we are lawbreakers and trespassers. The word trespass was a big word growing up for me because I grew up with hunters we were hunters and we would go to hunting clubs and there was property and the one thing you would understand is you better not cross those lines where it says no trespassing don't cross this line and I probably only crossed those lines I don't know a hundred times as a kid I would never do that now but as a kid my moral bearings you know weren't as clear okay so I thought that a no trespassing sign was a suggestion Come to find out it wasn't. A couple times got told to get off my property. In Mississippi, it's not property, it's property. It just kind of rolls out like that. Okay? No trespassing was a big deal. And here's what I understood. You cross this line, you have now trespassed. Now let me make clear in this room. Every one of us in this room and at all of our campuses and online joining us right now, we have all crossed God's lines. He drew lines for your mind, and we've all crossed them. 
Some of you have crossed his sexual lines. Some of you have crossed his financial lines. Some of you have crossed his idolatry lines. Some of you have crossed different lines that you would never want anyone to know. But every one of us in this room have this in common. We have crossed God's lines. We're trespassers. And the Bible says in Christ, all of us who have trespassed, and we all have, we have been redeemed from that. Our trespasses have been forgiven We aren't held accountable for them anymore because of Jesus and his blood. Jesus saves sinners. Number two, Jesus sanctifies believers. He sanctifies us. It's good news. Now, what's the difference in saving and sanctifying? Well, saving means we've been forgiven of our trespasses, but sanctification means we've been purified. Totally purified. He has cleansed us. Not 99.9, the way our dear friends at Lysol take care of our counters. No, we have been 100% purified, those of us who are in Christ. Hebrews 13, 12 says, Jesus suffered outside the gate in order to. Why was that all happening? And we need to understand as Christians. Jesus suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people, purify us through his own blood. Your inside, your spirit, your soul has been cleansed perfectly, washed white as snow by his blood. There is no other way that could have happened. Only through perfect, unblemished blood could that have happened. I want you to see something here. It's interesting. The the writer of Hebrews brings in a very physical thing into this spiritual idea. He says, Jesus suffered outside the gate. Why does that matter? It matters because that's where Jesus died. So you've got this picture of every Jesus movie you've ever seen of them walking Jesus up this gorgeous, beautiful hill, and it's windy, and, but it still there's a beauty to it. I'll tell you what, the Romans weren't going to work that hard to kill a guy. They took Jesus on the shortest walk they could to get him out of the city. So they weren't going to crucify him inside there. That would be too honorable. So they would take crucify victims, crucifixion victims, just outside the gate on the road. And on the side of the road, at the hill, at the base of the hill, they crucified him. This is why Pilate had a sign made in three different languages. Because he wanted everyone who would walk down the road that day to see, this is what the Roman Empire does to people who claim to be kings. You want to see what we do? This is what we do to them. So everyone can see. The Bible says that people were just walking by. You think they all walked up a hill to get a look at him? No, they're just walking down the road. There's a crucified guy. Read the sign, and the Bible says they would wag their heads at him. What that meant is they would roll their eyes. What an idiot. Who would ever try to be a king? Look at that guy. That's what happened to your Savior. That's the humiliation. Some people would walk up. Literally, they could approach him. They would walk up and spit on him on the cross. He was treated like an animal. So that you could be purified outside the gate that day. There was more happening on that cross than just another man being brutalized by a powerful empire. We were being cleansed. Thirdly, Jesus' blood protects the believer. Now this is going to be hard. A lot of people have a hard time with what I'm about to tell you. What was Jesus protecting us from? Well, some would say, and I think I probably would have thought this for a long time, Jesus' blood protects us from the devil. There's a sign on I-65 in Alabama. It says, uh, go to church or the devil's going to get you. Jesus' blood not protecting us from the devil. No, it's something greater, something bigger. Let's read what it says. In Romans 5, 9, it says, Since therefore we've now been justified by his blood... Much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Now, this is the real gospel. This is not the sanitized, modern sensibility. We don't want to be uncomfortable. We want everything nice and sweet and cuddly. That's not, that's not our gospel we've made up. That's some kind of idol that we've made up. No, the gospel of the Bible is a bloody one. It's a tough one. And here's the real truth. God... And Jesus protected you from himself, from his wrath. Now understand this, his wrath was righteous. There's nothing wrong about it. But God to remain just and perfect 
had to exact punishment against all sin. He could not hold that back. At some point, sin had to be paid for. And that was going to happen one way or the other. And so that you and I would not have to pay that debt that we could have never paid anyway, God comes himself and protects us from his own wrath by taking his own wrath upon himself so that sin could be paid for, it must, for him to remain just, and so that you and I could have a relationship with him for eternity. He accomplishes both in the person of Jesus and his blood. So yes, we do not declaw the line of Judah around here. He had rightful wrath against our rebellion, and it was taken care of in Jesus. He protects the believer, and then finally, it's good news. He secures the believer by his blood. We're secure in Jesus. It's irrevocable. It's not like, well, I, I got to spray my counter. My, my wife and I will spray our counters again today. Oh, we just sprayed them last night. But human beings are dirty, y'all. There'll be some stuff on the counter. Somebody will cut an apple. There'll be a little apple juice there. You know how it works. Just tss, tss, tss. I'll have to do it tomorrow and the next day and the next day. But Jesus secured it for us. It's a once and for all thing. Ephesians 2.13, but now, but now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. How do you get close to God? The blood of Jesus. You don't get close to him without the blood of Jesus. It's only through his blood, and we are secure in that. We're secure. One of my favorite uh, theologians, R.C. Sproul, was talking about the fact that on his 25th anniversary, he was going to buy his wife a diamond, and he wanted that diamond to represent how perfect he thought his wife was. So he called a friend who... Uh, was a person who dealt with diamonds and who was an expert. And his friend went on the hunt for a great diamond that R.C. could afford but would be a really great diamond to give his wife for 25th anniversary. And he introduced R.C. Sproul to, you may, have, you may know about this, the chart. Look at this chart that they have for diamonds. They have a clarity chart. What this is telling you is how flawed a diamond is or how, uh, how unflawed, I guess, would be the word. So either direction you want to go. And he came to R.C. Sproul and he said, look, I've got you a diamond that I can't find a flaw in. He said, I, with my instruments, I can't find a flaw. But he said, I will not give it a flawless distinction because I've never given a diamond that. And he said, and here's why. Because I don't believe that our atmosphere on this earth can produce a perfect diamond. I don't think there's ever been one. There's a flaw in that diamond. I just can't find it. He says, so I will give it the next rating down. And R.C. said, that'll be just fine, right? Because I can afford it. When you think about that, you think, there were a lot of lambs sacrificed over the years, right? In that sacrificial system. Probably some you would have said, that is the most beautiful, perfect lamb I've ever seen. But you just couldn't see the flaws. It was flawed. There had never been a perfect one. Not until the day the hammer swung on Golgotha and the first nail pierced his hands and feet. And in that moment, the first perfect blood was shed. Purifying us, saving us, protecting us. That is Jesus. And we thank him for it today. And I'm going to pray for us, and then I want to invite you to worship him for it today. Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice, for your blood. I pray that you will, Lord, be glorified in us today as we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.